So can you introduce um, yourself and talk a little about yourself? I have an introduction. Okay, all right. I'm Deja Grissom. I am a sophomore slash junior at Hampton University. Um, um, I am originally from West Baltimore. Uh, I went to a charter school called the Empowerment Academy for grades. Uh, pre-k to third grade and it was a very beautiful cultural experience it was mm -hmm. a charter school but it was literacy through the arts program so we had a lot of dancing theater um i had a teacher who taught us how to make jewelry out of clay oh wow um, that's really and interesting we did pottery we did a lot of art and that's what really influenced and inspired me to want to become a writer i wrote mm -hmm. my first book at the age of six wow it was called like Kelly's first day of school with some horrible stick figure drawings in there. Okay, um, <laughs> that's interesting. Um, and so my school and my church was very merged together. Um, I went to a church called Mount Hebrew Memorial Church of God in Christ. Mm -hmm. uh, it was like a minute away from my house. It was a walking distance, and that church really taught me the value of community, um, sharing, giving. Um, my pastor was very kind. I remember uh, one year, my mom, we were bad. We my sister were really bad. And uh -huh. um, my mom said we weren't going to have no Christmas presents. And my pastor actually came to my house with a contractor bag of toys. Oh, and he good. gave us Christmas. Like, it was amazing. Oh, okay. That's um, really good. So, yeah. And church, a single a choir. I did sunshine band. Oh. All those things that really fueled and fostered my creativity. Um, and. Yeah, I growing up in West Baltimore, it was rich with black history, not being far away from Sandtown, where Billie Holiday was, where Cab Calloway oh, was. Um, so I really would like to, um, I play a little piano, mm -hmm. like sometimes jazz piano mm -hmm. too. And um, um, with the church and like African American music, mm -hmm. what, what do you, how do you feel like the church uh, contributes to African um, American music well, gospel, and culture. Yes, well, gospel music is the center of all the other musical genres. Blues, That's what I feel like too. R&B, yeah. jazz, because mm -hmm. a lot of people grew up in church mm -hmm. um, exactly. making music. Like even mm -hmm. some of your famous people, like Aretha Franklin. You know, mm -hmm. their vocalization sounds like something of a black church, and the definitely. church, of, church yeah. of God in Christ is definitely key with having musicians like Walter Hopkins, Edwin Hopkins, you know, mm -hmm. uh, the Clark sisters came out of Church of God in Christ and mm -hmm. their music has inspired, inspired a lot of people too. Mm -hmm. And to this day, you know, Beyonce sampled one of their songs on her latest album, right? Mm -hmm. you know, like that, mm -hmm. that's, uh, his music was really big and I sang on a choir. So, um, yeah, I, I enjoyed my time in West Baltimore, but I ended up moving to Baltimore County, Owens Mills. So there, is that out in more in the countryside? Yes, or? that is in Baltimore County, so like 20 minutes away. Oh, it's more I suburbs. Yeah. So yeah, more suburbs. Uh -huh. It was a different culture. Um, mm -hmm. The Empowerment Academy had like less than two, 300 students, about 200, 300 students-ish in mm -hmm. the ballpark. Mm -hmm. So you knew everyone and everyone knew you. And mm -hmm. I had a teacher who wasn't even my teacher become my mentor because she saw I needed help and I needed guidance. Mm -hmm. So when I got to my other schools, I didn't understand the culture. Like mm -hmm. at my school um, in Baltimore Town, Temper Grove, you had students that were bad to the point where teachers were crying. Um, oh. I walked past the hallway now. This was a true story, and there was a kid standing in a locker, and the teacher was just begging the kid to get out the locker. Oh. I said, oh, this different. <laughs> that is different, yes. <laughs> like, I couldn't understand. That's really crazy, yeah, isn't it? Like, just minding my business, and I see that. And I didn't. <laughs> oh, my gosh. <laughs> yeah. So that was in, in Baltimore? Then. In Baltimore County. In Baltimore, Baltimore County. County. In Baltimore yeah. County. Yes. Yeah. So it was rougher there than yes. within um, Baltimore City. Baltimore City. Yeah. That's interesting. Yeah. Cause Do you feel like, like I, I mean, uh, the, the educational system in the U.S. is, is kind of collapsing? And, it's and, falling and, apart. In, in elementary and in high school. And, yeah. yeah, and my wife, she, um, last year she taught as a substitute um, for like elementary schools in mm -hmm. Hampton. Mm -hmm. And she, she really paid attention to the kids, 
they really needed somebody to listen to them. But some of the um, teachers would just yell. They would just come in and just, like, my wife is very soft spoken and, and like, uh, and listens and everything. But some teachers would just get in there and they would vent about, I don't know, maybe their personal life is not going yeah. well either, too, I think. And, but, but she actually, surprisingly, you know, even though she got a master's degree in, in, in English from VCU, mm -hmm. really liked teaching the yeah. younger kids, yeah. and, and then now she's teaching in the high school. Yeah. But, I mean, there's so many, do you feel like, what, what happened when you went to high school? Like, oh! Well, I moved to, I stayed in Baltimore County for a year and I moved to Howard County. Howard County is a, one of the richest counties in the U.S. It's okay, is that in uh, Maryland? Maryland as yes. well? Yes. But it's not in Baltimore? No, it's okay. not in Baltimore. Howard County is like... So you're a part of the a privileged kind of area, the community <laughs> then to some yes. extent. To some extent. Right? Yeah. Um, so what do you think about all of those inequalities in, in America? It's, well... It's, it's, I feel like, well, for me, ooh, ooh, I can talk to you about Howard County. <laughs> Good. I feel like Howard County Public Schools uh, fails black children. Oh, um, wow. Mm -hmm. They're very, very much, they're like the Wiz and the Wizard of Oz, very mm -hmm. much pro diversity, equity, and inclusion. Mm. And um, they are failing at that. Um, presently, they probably are doing better, mm. but I went from being into a predominantly black school that had connected to a black church mm -hmm. and did stuff with a standard of excellence. I'm like, mm. mm -hmm. <clears throat> I'm not going to say what I was going to say just then. Mm -hmm. um, no, that's fine. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I was about to say something shady. Um, oh, okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> no, 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 no. Okay. Um, okay. <laughs> to, uh, <laughs> Howard County Schools, uh -huh. where it was like they would sit the black children in the back where, where I live, I should say where I live in um, Ellicott City in elementary school, like they would sit the black children in the back of the classroom or like you would get yelled at. Um, so you, I mean, you also definitely, so then you definitely have experienced some trauma there. Yes, mm -hmm. I mean, elementary school, um, I was in fifth grade in Howard County in Ellicott City. You could, I mean, it was well everywhere. Mm -hmm. uh, middle school wasn't too bad because you had a mixture of people. You had staff and administrators that actually care. So mm -hmm. empowerment academy. Like I was able to just go So middle to, school wasn't that yes. bad. That's interesting. Yeah. Because I tend to think of middle school as like a the place way. where yeah, yeah. I told my wife like don't don't go to middle school and teach <laughs> in middle school because but I mean I, I think I was wrong to do that. I just mm -hmm. just because people are growing up then and going through some certain changes and sometimes it's very difficult to deal with rebellious people mm -hmm. but on the other hand it that's that's also probably not right because I mean there are a lot of those 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 uh, kids need need support they need the good teachers and it it does seem like a lot of people are are moving out of the profession of, yeah. of teaching because of things like you were talking yeah. about <laughs> or other things that we were talking about yeah. that we will not mention here. <laughs> but, yeah. but I think that's a reality. A lot of yeah. people are like, why, why, why go through all of this? Yeah. <laughs> but on the other hand, we need, need mm -hmm. teachers. We need, um, we need uh, a, a, a more equitable society. Mm -hmm. So you, you talked about diversity and equity and inclusion. and inclusion not really working. So can you talk more about I that? I mean, um, so middle school was fine. I had teachers and professors who, teachers who really supported me. Like I would write stories. I wrote a whole story. Mm -hmm. um, Cause uh, let's see, I wrote Up From Eden. Mm -hmm. It's a book I wrote, uh, mm -hmm. 100 pages written by hand. Oh, um, good. Took place in 2015 mm -hmm. um, when the Baltimore riots was happening in the High Black oh. Lives Matter movement. So I very interesting. That, um, because I was a Baltimore native, I didn't live too far from where you know Freddie Gray took place. And yeah, um, I remember that. I still remember that. Yeah, that's the really set on fire. I didn't live uh, lived mm -hmm. in the Coppin Heights district, so that's uptown Fulton. So it was like five minute, two minute drive, really over there. Um, so people in my middle school was trying to put their mouths on something that they didn't know about because you're pushing, you're pushing a narrative that you don't understand about Freddie Gray mm -hmm. or about Baltimore because Sandtown, Winchester, which is the area Freddie Gray lived in, my dad lived in that area when he was a little kid, and you know, Baltimore was a 
that uh, place known for like Lambert Steel or mm. Bethleh Bethlehem Steel. I'm sorry, it's mm. the company that they had there. Mm. And you know, you had people making their income for years with that company, and the mm -hmm. company started doing outsourcing, and the place fell into poverty. And exactly, yes, yeah. and that's a big problem right yeah. now, right? Yeah. Because even with the auto workers strike mm -hmm. in uh, Detroit mm -hmm. and things like that, um, working class communities sometimes aren't being supported yeah. by American businesses and and um but do you feel like the, the white uh it's it's hard to talk about <laughs> white community in a monolithic block but you know um some conservative uh white whites um why do you feel like they they feel because this one conservative white person brought this up to me she's like well my son is is oh. bisexual and i support you know the lgbtq plus community but she said she, and she really kind of almost wanted to pick a fight with me mm -hmm. she said i don't support black lives matter though and she was like talking to me directly <laughs> and i was like but i just thought that's very interesting like like you know so why as a white woman why are you not wanting to, you know wanting to say how black people should feel about events that happen mm -hmm. within the african-american mm -hmm. community and telling black people what to say mm -hmm. it, it, it seems uh, very yeah. problematic in some ways especially since she might not like like you were bringing up she might not know anything mm -hmm. about it except for the, the sound bites or the things that mm -hmm. she's heard yeah. on on in the media yeah mm -hmm. um so that was one thing major dealing with that at centennial i went to high school centennial high school mm -hmm. i mean it used to be a plantation the expectations were low anyway uh, but mm -hmm. <laughs> but um you know people just thought because i was from baltimore you know me living in Howard county was some magical utopia mm -hmm. but it, it wasn't um mm -hmm. i think um my my dad was a correctional officer, so like mm -hmm. when we lived in Baltimore, people wouldn't, they didn't really mess with us too much. Mm -hmm. We were all on a block where everyone knew each other, so mm -hmm. you, we didn't have those issues, mm -hmm. right? So um, the narrative was like, well, oh, you should be glad you should be out here, but mm -hmm. I'm in these classrooms. I got called the N-word walking up. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> they were chanting the N-word in the news. Um, so, so you think that this is also from the, like, why, okay, so I'm really interested in this in the sense that, I mean, why do you think, like, do you think, like, um, and it was some, uh, another student that I interviewed also mm -hmm. was from Detroit, he's, he, he mentioned similar things, like, um, that people kind of felt empowered mm -hmm. because of Trump and yeah. that he That's was able to get away with some of these things and maybe still is today right yeah. and so they feel like they some white students not mm -hmm. all of course but you know some white students feel empowered mm -hmm. to um to buy what trump was saying yeah. and do you think that that had some impact on all of this like the trump did, what happened because i wasn't really here in this country during that time frame so so i started um, my ninth grade career as Donald Trump was getting into office. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it was, you could feel the tension in my school. Mm -hmm. um, but the, the issue was you had people who were blatantly racist and then they were what I call colorblind racist. Mm -hmm. right? So um, even having an English teacher reading um, To Kill a Mockingbird and mm -hmm. she's she's in love with the killer mockingbird like she mm -hmm. didn't want her kids scout i said that's mm -hmm. just doing too much for me mm -hmm. um and so even just being in class and we had to have a debate on whether or not the n-word should be used in mm -hmm. this book it was kind of like well you weren't thinking about the black students when you was doing that and me mm -hmm. really being one person on one side of the of this debate oh that's acting, a good point that's a good point acting, having to contend with that i didn't use text evidence but i didn't think i had to use text evidence because for obvious reasons like because you are <laughs> african american <laughs> yeah. Yeah, right? yeah, like, you are the textual evidence yes, sometimes I, right I am. so she let all the other people win i mean it was like 20 of them versus one of me and it was a couple of friends um, a couple of my other peers of color who was on the other side that was more so like we don't know how we feel about that um and mm -hmm. then even going back to that teacher um 
Thank so what do you think about yeah. about it in the uh, well, at the end of the day like whether how, or not we should have in words and books mm -hmm. um simple solution i guess we shouldn't erase history but if you're going to say we're going to teach this curriculum we should have books in there um by african americans and no reading of black course. like me does not count Mm -hmm. It does not count. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. It's a lot of different black literature that you can read. I know what a mm -hmm. Pittsburgh scenes, my angel, James Paul. Right, right. Like, you could do that instead of even having that debate. But um, that's a good point. Yeah. So more diversity. Yes. And um, but I think like if you're reading like Mark Twain, which I feel mm -hmm. like sometimes, or even even in African American literature, mm -hmm. sometimes you will see that. Yeah, word. you will. So. Um, so I think like um, maybe also just referring it as the to as the N word, but then then also I think having the students talk about it and the the racism that existed yeah. within American society it still does exist. and still does <laughs> exist. Yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah, uh, you know, um, I went to her. Because uh, it's the GT research program, mm -hmm. and I was signing up. Like, my thesis was going to be like how African American literature impacted American culture. Mm -hmm. And she basically told me, Well, it's a good thing, but you know, you can't really say these things because black books are starting to be incorporated into the curriculum because middle school is reading it. The hate you give at that time. They were only reading the hate you give at that time because of the height of the Black Lives Matter movement. You guys don't care. Mm. <laughs> like, you guys really don't care. Like, mm -hmm. if I were to go to administration today or tomorrow, you guys really wouldn't care. Because my sister went to the same high school and it was worse. Mm -hmm. You had people, um, my sister had a teacher who said the black kids in the back of the classroom because she could tell the difference between them. Um, my sister had a 4 point GPA. People mm -hmm. didn't believe she was from Baltimore because she had that high of a GPA. They didn't believe she was black she American is. because yeah. she had that high of a GPA, right? Right. Like, and, you know, my sister going on to study at Yale, right? Mm -hmm. um, doing different things, being a historian, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. going to Johns Hopkins. You know, mm -hmm. she dropped out, but that's okay. That's a whole other thing. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> right. Yeah. But, like... It was an idea that we weren't intelligent because of our skin color and where we were from. And that's not true because the fact of the matter is I know how to do my work better than you. Mm -hmm. right? <laughs> In some degree. Not to be cocky. But. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, um, so do you feel like um, that the U.S. has become more racially polarized as like time has uh, like more divided or has it... Um, what has happened in your viewpoint Ooh. like since I mean it, mm -hmm. you know the, Barack Obama was president at one point yeah. and, and for two terms mm -hmm. but um, but there's there's obviously you know so much work to be done mm -hmm. and yet um, and how I how how do you think um, like all these divides mm -hmm. and all these, uh, all these different viewpoints, yeah. and like as you said, even also color blindness. Mm -hmm. um, how do you? How can? How can we try to resolve some of this? I mean, it may not be resolved in the short term, but how? What are your ideas about? Now, do you want a more biblical answer, or do you want the social answer? It's. It's. I think both. You can give both. I this is your interview. You know. <laughs> As a Christian and mm -hmm. having the Christian worldview and mm -hmm. growing up where faith was the anchor of everything I did and mm -hmm. having a close relationship with Jesus, mm -hmm. I think it's a heart problem, right? Mm -hmm. I really do think it's a heart problem. These people, people don't wake up and do evil racist things like Dylan Roof mm -hmm. because they, it's really a heart problem. That's so a good point. I think if you... And you don't even have to be a Christian to yeah. do that. It's just like yeah. a spiritual... Spiritual problem, but do you feel like it's become easier for people to hate in this country? It's a paradox, mm -hmm. like a country that has built itself upon Christianity, but mm -hmm. you don't well, see the love sometimes well, in the uh, in the in the country. <laughs> like, where is it? <laughs> well, we could argue whether or not it was really built on Christianity. Mm -hmm. Because Thomas Jefferson was the his, so was George Washington. They, I mean, Jefferson wrote a whole different version of mm -hmm. a Bible that, mm -hmm. anyway. But he, even the, the, the fact that there's so many churches throughout <laughs> yeah. the United yeah. States 
but there's not many people practicing mm -hmm. loving their neighbor. Yeah, yeah it feels yeah. like that. Yeah. That seems to be a mm -hmm. tremendous irony. I mean, if people were serious more mm -hmm. about religion, mm -hmm. or if they were serious about spirituality, yeah. even let's just even put it in that level, mm -hmm. yeah. then we wouldn't have uh, some of this. Do you think that some of these people are people who desperately like? I mean, who need psychiatric I do think, help? Like, I mean, to I do think some degree it is psychiatric help that they mm -hmm. need. Um, also, I just think the whole issue with racism and everything with racism in this country, I really feel like it's a, really, it's a spiritual thing. Really. It's a spiritual I thing. I really do think it's mm -hmm. like an evil, it's a sin problem. Mm -hmm. um, so effective ways that we could do it, um, we could talk about it mm -hmm. and try to fix it. Um, mm -hmm. First of all, this is going to sound terrible, get rid of everyone that's in Congress. Um, <laughs> <laughs> because some of them are you know, they're elderly. Mm -hmm. They're not in touch with some of the issues that we have. Right. Um, I'm not shading Mitch McConnell. He's just up there. <laughs> yes. You know? Um, right, they're not in touch. But then we even also have younger, it is interesting yeah. that we have younger people mm -hmm. who are also not in touch, uh, <laughs> not in touch you yeah. know? So, and I think we have a general view, like problem in general with our whole system is kind of constructed for those people in Congress mm -hmm. and uh, to, and, and um, the president and to become like a career politician and yeah. even like Obama kind of in a second term a little went towards that a little you know mm -hmm. where you're, you're you're getting so involved in what's happening in Washington DC and in the presidency but you're losing a little touch with the uh, people, people yeah. who are 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 struggling in their everyday lives, yeah. and um, they, I mean, you could say like also, um, so so would you, what do you think like you you think like more dialogue is more. Big, is really important dialogue. like open dialogue? Yeah, dialogue is important. The sharing the actual history when you see the resurrect the insurrection that happened in 2021, it reminds mm -hmm. me of the one that happened in Wilmington, mm -hmm. you know, that I learned about in my African American states class in college. Mm -hmm. um, basically, these people didn't mm -hmm. like the people who were elected, and so they just overthrew the government and ran all the black people out of town. Well, doesn't that sound like history repeating itself, right? Yes. Like, so it is a denial of, I guess, African American experience mm -hmm. and the trauma that comes with it. Like I wrote my paper on you gonna read it, don't you? I can. but I wrote my paper about history, how mm -hmm. African American history is under attack, and mm -hmm. specifically yes, we've been Florida. talking about that in class, right? Yeah, in Florida. Mm -hmm. Um, and it talks about, you know, Ron DeSantis saying slavery was a good thing, you know. <laughs> you know, you know like, Can you what? imagine even, I mean, like, how can that even be said yeah. whatsoever, you know? Um, and then, like, um, why, why is, why are people politic? I mean, okay, you, ha you I can understand where you can politicize race, you know, or your identity and everything mm -hmm. in America. But I also feel like it's it, it, it is a political issue, but it yeah. is it is also something that really as if we were to be a country, yeah. it shouldn't be really just a political issue, like a Republican or Democratic it issue. Be, it should be we should under try to understand mm -hmm. each other as human beings. As human yeah. beings. And, and it shouldn't just be seen through a, a a political lens. And I feel like when putting it under the political lens always is also some way of sweeping it under the rug. Yeah, Do you is. ever feel like it that? Really, it really is. Um, because Black Lives Matter, like they swept it under the rug as, oh, that's a liberal mm -hmm. kind of thing or movement. But I think it's so much bigger than that. I was yeah. talking about that in class, you know, like where I really feel like it's about like, just think about the, the whole concept of saying Black Lives yeah. don't matter. Yeah. I mean, just yeah. think of that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Not the movement Black Lives Matter, mm -hmm. but I'm just saying, of course, black lives ma need to matter. Mm -hmm. And then look at all the history yeah, where black lives were not treated yeah. as though they mattered. And still today, mm -hmm. you have that problem. Yeah, with the, and so, so it's not that 
but 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 people have like the politi politicization of mm -hmm. something, and then it's almost like we don't we we no longer need to talk about it, <laughs> but we we actually do mm -hmm. because it's it's not simply just a political issue; it's like it's the human lives are mm -hmm. involved in it. Yeah. So can you speak more I, about it because you wrote about Black think, Lives Matter? I think um, I wrote. Did I write? Yeah. You said you did. Yeah. It to was, some way. Yeah, okay. yeah, a little bit. I okay. Wrote about that. Um, well, I would just say, um, in America, we don't see each other as human beings. It's mm. like a us versus them narrative, mm, black, sometimes. white, you know. And a lot of times, yeah, all over the place, right? Because it's all competition mm -hmm. sometimes, yeah. too, as well. And then you do have the thing of intersectionality, of how, like, your race, your gender, your sexual orientation mm -hmm. impacts how you navigate society. Mm -hmm. And so, for me, I would say, I think it's really tragic and it's really sad to watch America, you know, spiral. Into, yes, it feels like it's spiral. It's <laughs> into, a good, that's a good point. Yeah. Into just, like, a place of complete and utter brokenness. But it's always hope, right? Mm -hmm. um, so, Do you think it's the lack of empathy too? Like a lot is, of people a have, we, we, we have talked about it in some of my classes and students have brought mm -hmm. it up, a lack of empathy. Lack of empathy, a mm. lack of maturity, I think, overall. Yes. Yeah. Because we're not having these conversations that's needed and then it feels like sometimes we're in, particularly as a black person, it feels like we're in oppression. Uh, politics. So mm -hmm. it's kind of like oppression Olympics. It's like, well, which... More and you don't want to be this. that, right? You want to be, you want to <laughs> be, you know, just you want to also talk about yeah. just who you are, are and it's individual. not just like a political mm -hmm. statement always, yeah. or for a party or something. You are black, but it's like, like I'm black, but I'm more than that. Right? Yeah, more than whatever mm -hmm. is constructed to be in, yeah. in this country, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. One of the last students also talked to me about like she felt like um, America is becoming more segregated. It's mm -hmm. not like a official kind of segregation, yeah. but it's like it's becoming more segregated, and that that that's it's very troubling because there's this kind of an expectation from people from my generation who are more progressive looking mm -hmm. who would kind of think like oh the younger generation is just gonna solve things yeah, <laughs> but no, that, no. that's sometimes a very 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 it's, limited way of looking at it right yeah um <laughs> even just being an older gen z like i'm 22 mm -hmm. and so like i'm around 18 year olds all day I'm like oh you guys raised a little differently mm -hmm. you there you go you, even with you do that you do that okay that's on you you mm -hmm. know mm -hmm. um but i just think so far as like whew, I don't want to say America is doomed because that sounds terrible. No, but it's a it's a very <laughs> difficult situation, and I've <laughs> and I've talked to some students, you know, about it, and it's like we're kind of talking about it, but we really none of us really I, nobody really knows like, what's happening. Like, what is happening? We need, <laughs> we need a lot of prayer. We need yeah. a lot of prayer. Yeah. Um, like I said, my Christian faith. Like, I one thing that I've learned being a Christian. Mm -hmm. um, I got saved when I was like 10, 10 mm -hmm. yeah, fifth, fifth grade, around mm -hmm. fifth grade. One thing that Jesus had to really teach me because I really hated white people. Mm -hmm. And you know that is a contradiction to the whole entire faith. Mm -hmm. But one thing he had to teach me is like there are people just like you and you have to forgive them, right? Mm -hmm. Because they're dealing with a level of brokenness that you may not see. Mm -hmm. You know, even though it seems like they have more privileges and society and stuff like that they they're still human they still cry you know right, they cut themselves, right. they're gonna bleed right. so it's not that i take a passive approach i just try to gauge and understand the person where they are mm -hmm. instead of just outright judging them I mm -hmm. and i think working for the hgc times working for mccall great liberator um I, I had a shift in almost like my political viewpoint because I was writing stuff about like womanism mm. and intersectionality mm. and stuff like that. And I'm like, well, wait a minute. I don't think that is necessarily befitting to me because sometimes when you go into those other spaces, it feels like you're othered because mm. I'm first both Christian and black. So sometimes mm. liberation theology or liberation politics contradict things of the faith right because mm. for me i can't be like i hate all white people because mm. that's not 
with the faith teachers, right? Right, right? But we can recognize even as like black Christians that hey, racism is a thing, it impacts us, right? And we mm-hmm. can see the influence of the black church mm-hmm. being a part of the resolve mm-hmm. for racism and early civil rights movement. You saw like people like Dr. King like right. ushering that in and you know, mm-hmm. my church being found by a man, C. H. Mason, who was slavery, you know, who came out of slavery, right? Mm-hmm. And when you get to very very much church nerd, but church history like the Zeus Street Revival, you had mm-hmm. people like Re- Reverend William J. Seymour who had the vision in the early nineteen hundreds to have an integrated church right mm. and that's what they were working towards mm-hmm. and we have the formation of the church of god in christ and then it was white ministers a part of the church of god in christ but they left the church of god in christ to form the assemblies of god because mm. they didn't want to be in church with other segregation yeah. yeah yeah but now we have a long time ago i actually mm-hmm. attended a black church i was yeah. like my wife and i we uh-huh. both did uh-huh. So, <laughs> oh, I mean, we were part of the choir too. Ooh, so it was interesting. Was it? <laughs> uh, but it was not a. It, might, it wasn't like a Baptist church. Mm-hmm. It was uh, tied to the, to the college where we were, mm-hmm. we were teaching at an HBCU, which mm-hmm. was St. Paul's College, which eventually closed down. Oh. And um, mm-hmm. but um, it was an Episcopal church, so yeah. it was a little so different. Like, I mean, yeah. I think yeah. I, I I don't know. I would say that yeah. maybe it's different than mm-hmm. some experiences mm-hmm. you know uh, maybe a little closer to my like my wife is in North Eastern Orthodox because she, okay. she comes from Serbia yeah but I'm kind of like um open-minded <laughs> person like yeah. in spirituality I like uh-huh. spirituality I've gone to different different uh, even different faiths and mm-hmm. you know, I see the interconnection of things mm-hmm. I think spirituality is really important but I really we enjoyed being part of that community yeah. you know yeah. But I just feel like um, it's a shame that like a lot of times that America is so segregated mm-hmm. in a lot of ways, in some ways. It's, it, and that part, I think, is a, a problem because we need, we need to communicate on a deeper level. And I think like white privilege, um, I think that's something that white people could like understand more and and fight back against mm-hmm. a little like about you, you might I mean the society is structured where there is this white privilege that mm-hmm. exists mm-hmm. but on the other hand like you can you can acknowledge it and you can also try to change it yeah. like you could be an instrument of change mm-hmm. instead of being like a Oh, I feel um, guilty. Yeah. Um, so let's like, end the conversation right now. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I feel like a lot of America is based on right now. Is like the part is like I feel guilty. I I don't want to. Uh, let's end the conversation right now. But I don't think that's. That's like that's not a mature response. You're going back to the maturity. Yeah, yeah. It's not, and it's not a real response. And if we really talk to each other and try to listen to each other, find out mm-hmm. more mm-hmm. about what's happening. And try to be even more instruments yeah. of change to uh-huh. some extent, but yeah. yeah, what do you, what do you, but do you, what do you think about the prospects of that in That's our society? How divided it is now. And well, I thought about my grandma. Mm-hmm. I have a white adopted grandmother. Oh, okay. Who, uh-huh. you know, she, her, and my mom worked at Johns Hopkins back in the day. She worked for the mm-hmm. Africa Life Division, so mm-hmm. she's well traveled in the world. Like she mm-hmm. speaks French. Uh, mm-hmm. She married a Frenchman in the sixties. Mm-hmm. Like she went to Oberlin. She's a Quaker and she's very much active uh-huh. in our community. So, like, uh-huh. even having her, my grandmama there, like, taking me to Black History Museums, right? This mm-hmm. is an older white woman, right? Mm-hmm. Taking me to Black History Museums, uh, showing me art mm-hmm. you know, in different pieces, you know, taking me to see Streetcar Named Desire. Like, mm-hmm. so, um, it, it, it is those people that you can have in your life, even though that they may be different races than you are, you can still have that inner connection. Of course, of course. If there was more dialogue, too, then we could is, be yeah. learning more from yeah. each other. There And there mm-hmm. is more dialogue a lot of times in everyday life, but there's also not sometimes. Yeah. So. <laughs> so even the story of how my grandmama and my mm-hmm. mom got to know that, like, my mom was pregnant with me, it was a difficult pregnancy, I'm mm-hmm. baby, and she heard about it, mm-hmm. and she wanted to kind of just be a part of the journey and the experience. Right? Mm-hmm. So it's kind of like, okay, that's not someone doing something out of white guilt or anything like that. That's mm-hmm. just having just regular human 
concern, right? Right, right. So that's how that bond, and I think she would be brilliant to interview for your book. Um, mm-hmm. Because my girl's well traveled, so. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, that's that, interesting, that's, yeah. That's a beautiful bond to have, uh-huh. right? I think it's also very interesting, like how you talked about, like how you, at, at, like when you were younger, you grew up hating white people. <laughs> so I think maybe you need to talk a little more about that <laughs> because I think like that's that's okay to bring it up, and then also like, uh, um, how do you feel like um, that kind of those kind of barriers could be broken? down in some ways or yeah. or deal with it you know instead of like just just like saying like oh that sometimes doesn't exist mm-hmm. or that doesn't happen mm-hmm. you know so for me that mm-hmm. that really that part of not liking the white people mm-hmm. started kind of at a very young age kind of mm-hmm. i was at a part like baltimore mm-hmm. Is one of the first cities to adopt the first city to adopt Jim Crow laws and mm. uh, redlining is very prevalent in the city. So I didn't um, know that. Yes. Like I mean, I I, 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 yes. I, I I kind of saw like Baltimore is more predominantly African American. So in the city, in the West Baltimore. Oh, so it's only in one part it's of the West Baltimore. Oh, so like okay. when you go to Baltimore, it's really wild. This is wild. Yeah. Um, so oh. West Baltimore is predominantly African American. There's a lot of food deserts. It's nothing but row homes. You could go like, uh, you could go like ten blocks and not see a grocery store. Oh, but if geez. I were to go to East Baltimore, where it's more like mixed race, mm-hmm. um, you'd be grocery store businesses mm-hmm. off the wazoo, right? Mm-hmm. So Baltimore was very uh, prevalent in just just that distinction of going to the other side of the street, and knowing where you were and where you were supposed to be, mm-hmm. going, right? Like, mm-hmm. like, um, graduated and so it's also the feeling of being yeah. so that maybe also made you feel that yeah. way because you're 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 it's yeah. like you're kind of feeling suffocated like why am i being denied yeah. certain yeah. opportunities is that correct mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and so i had uncle like i have family over east baltimore east baltimore is prettier than west baltimore and mm-hmm. i don't think that's a coincidence to coincidence because yeah. it's a higher white population mm-hmm. right um and so even my mom, you know, she was a part of the busing back in the day, back in the 70s. Mm-hmm. And so, like, she went to a school in part of Baltimore, and it was like, if you were, as a black kid, you had to be out by a certain time. If you didn't catch that last bus, you would probably get jumped by the white kids. Um, mm-hmm. You know, being the first integrated class in 1978 in City College. Like, think about that. Like, mm-hmm. that's, that's really wild. Like, I remember when I was a kid in Norfolk to like um, just like the way busing would work Mm -hmm. is like if I went into a bus with all black Mm -hmm. kids, you know, then they would all say, white boy, white boy, Mm -hmm. (laughs) oh, you're going to get off on this. And it's just reminded, but then there's all this inequality, Mm -hmm. you know, so I was from an educated family and, and open you know, to diversity, mm-hmm. and but I feel like um, the the uh, the society has all of these prejudices, yeah. and it's just I think it's unfortunate, like yeah. like uh, because we could be so much more, mm-hmm. and kind of like when Obama came around, and there's that opportunity. I feel like that yeah. that's good. That's a beginning. Uh, but I feel like um, America just has so much of like the the racism built it. into it, and then mm-hmm. like even one of my friends in in middle school in Norfolk, like he was tall and African American, and there was a white man who mm-hmm. tried to run over him with a pickup truck oh, no. back. This is a long time ago. Mm-hmm. This is way before you were born. <laughs> but that was in the time frame when breakdancing was yeah. popular and I was doing breakdancing with, with the black community too. Mm-hmm. And it, it just, but I feel like that was like, uh, um, there's there's just like, there all the, 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 these things have not gone away and it's just like, and then the the solutions that are being proposed it's not like the mm-hmm. politicians aren't solving it ordinary people aren't really mm-hmm. solving it yeah. i think you were bringing that up yeah. too and it's like 
and then we're involved in it and there needs to be that's why I think like an interview like this is also very important there needs to be dialogue there needs to be communication there needs to be truth said mm -hmm. and you know I otherwise how are we going to bring about uh, any kind of change <laughs> And yeah. that's what I aspired to do because I told you I'm going to be a filmmaker and all. Uh -huh. yeah. So what I saw growing up, like as a black Christian, a lot mm -hmm. of the content, Christian content wasn't made for black people or people of color. Mm -hmm. um, so what I wanted to do, Love Alive, is what I want to title my entertainment company, uh -huh. is to create a space where Christians of color and African Americans mm -hmm. can have the outlet to express their themselves but also contend for the faith mm -hmm. and also express how they live in mm -hmm. a different world view mm -hmm. like they have a different world view right mm -hmm. and it's not that we're eliminating white people in that story it's mm -hmm. a, it's a place to have those black and brown faces um, mm -hmm. focus on focus on of but course. still of course have white people and have like theological opportunities and creative opportunities to do that right but it doesn't yeah. have to be the central central message message right, right. yeah so it is a great place to start having dialogue, even just in the church community. About because then it might see a different viewpoint point. of the yeah. African American community, yeah. rather than seeing African American community in a more minority mm -hmm. environment where you're yeah. a minority, mm -hmm. which is also part of the yeah. part of the African American mm -hmm. experience, right? Mm -hmm. So um, both. Mm -hmm. All right. Oh, yeah. or even not doing both. Yeah. Just doing one. <laughs> yeah, it's fine. Yeah. So I think like, uh, do you think that it can also reach a, a broader audience as well too? Yeah, most definitely. It will be able mm -hmm. to reach a broader, broader audience, and people can see themselves. Because when you think about like the Christian faith being on a rise in you know the continent of Africa or in Asia, and you would see. Mm -hmm. I remember one girl was telling me she came to our club. Um, mm -hmm. She was saying she didn't know there were any other Asian Christians. Right? Mm -hmm. So that 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 says something, right? And mm -hmm. we is such a powerful tool um, to have those conversations. And I think um, it was a shifting in maybe even church culture in America mm -hmm. um, with twenty twenty and you know the Black Lives Matter people. I guess were more realizing. I think the pandemic made people realize the value of life, right? The sanctity of human life, right? Do you feel like sometimes it did and sometimes it sometimes didn't? It didn't. Um, mm -hmm. Because I feel like today in America, in certain settings, in certain um, contexts, we are still arguing over what is life and what isn't life, right? So, yeah. <laughs> so Definitely. It's, it's and also sometimes wild. very much on a superficial level. Like, yeah. it's like uh, let's, let's just make it entirely about abortion mm -hmm. or entirely mm -hmm. about certain things. But, like, actual human life in mm -hmm. our lives in this mm -hmm. world sometimes... Yeah. I feel like we're not doing always the best job of even understanding uh, people and even like with the pandemic in mm -hmm. general too and um, you know and then going back to like anger or hatred or different things that exist all around the world mm -hmm. it's like I think since the, since the pandemic has become a little easier mm -hmm. for people to just be angry mm -hmm. and and take things out in mm -hmm. violent ways i don't yeah. know if you feel like that's happening it, it, it is most mm -hmm. definitely and i feel like we're just becoming desensitized to violence mm -hmm. like i to be honest i don't understand why after the dc sniper shootings happen why we don't have like why how is it that it wrote, uh, that was scary that, that one and that was yeah. that was a that was a what was a, yeah like a African American mm -hmm. man and then a young man yeah. and he was molesting the young man yeah. and then that was a horrific kind it of thing but then they all thought it was a, they thought this serial killer has to be a white person yeah. because there were a lot of mm -hmm. white serial killers and yeah. it's true but I mean I the other and it's just like also symptomatic of mm -hmm. all the violence. There's yeah. just like a lot of violence in American yeah. society. And we could we could bring up situations like Alec, the Amer American mm -hmm. Legislative Committee. Mm -hmm. Why are these companies such as Wendy's and mm -hmm. I believe Walmart is a part of it mm -hmm. lobbying Congress, right? Mm -hmm. And NRA is lobbying Congress. We're yes. 
That's like, true. even the, the type of gun, I wrote an article about this for my journalism class, mm. um, the type of gun that was used, the Bushmaster is mm. the name of the country, name of the company, I'm sorry. Mm. That company was used, the guns that was manufactured manufactured for the DC sniper shooting, right? Those same guns were used in the Sandy Hook shooting, right? Oh, and then, so yeah. the company had the had the privilege of filing bankruptcy and paying seventy million dollars to the families of Sandy Hook. Mm. Well, why why was that even a thing? Sandy Hook should not have been a thing. Like no. none of these shootings should be a thing. And no. it's ridiculous when we have students, survivors like the Parkland shooting survivors going before Congress and congressmen are demeaning them and everything. And even like artificial that. intelligence like is saying you could never really um, ban guns in America because it's not the American way but I mean like there were amendments to the mm -hmm. Constitution and you know I'm not saying that mm -hmm. it has to be that you know our our Second Amendment rights mm -hmm. would be taken away but um, but I do feel like guns have caused so much violence mm -hmm. and to us mm -hmm. and, and and also could you speak about the black community and how gun violence has affected the black community? I mean it's very much prevalent. Mm -hmm. um, it's a serious issue I would say. Mm -hmm. um, my dad being a correctional officer he had some stories on that. Mm -hmm. um, actually he was in the jail with Lee Boyd Melville. He was one of the officers that escorted him in. Mm -hmm. So like when we mm. talk about like that connection there, it's kind mm. of wild. Um, but it's a lot of issues with guns, and I would say it's almost like every day in Black America, it's a shooting. Mm. Um, but I don't think it's enough care put on, because Black life isn't respected in general, right? So it's going so back to Black lives do matter, not yeah. just the movement, but in reality. In reality, we do matter, and mm -hmm. sometimes issues in our community as well because it's like a don't ask, don't tell. We're not going to snitch on this person because mm. we don't necessarily trust our government because mm. they'll Or the you, police force. Or the police force because Sometimes. they'll put you in witness protection and people can still come find you and kill you, right? So... And there are even also, even sometimes African-American police officers who engage in police brutality yeah, towards, uh, towards, towards, yeah, yeah. towards African-Americans yeah. themselves. So yeah. it's like... That which is which is um, ironic, right? Because mm -hmm. I mean, it's it's almost like it's almost like when we had back in the day, you got slave catchers and they were hired from the slaves to be slave catchers. Like mm -hmm. it, it, it's it's the same thing. There's this see? kind of discrimination. Yeah. Do you think it, ed education is also really important? Like um, the education of the police force mm -hmm. or the education, yeah, yeah so most, they to avoid some of these things. Most definitely, but I think. I don't want to be this person, but the police be getting Ku Klux Klan. That's what it be getting. It be really giving the Klan this year. Um. Some people are really. <laughs> yeah, so you yeah. feel that it's really like infiltrating the police force? Yeah, oh, I think it really existed before yeah, and, and, and part of the police force. Yeah, definitely. Even my dad getting racially profiled in his uniform, in <laughs> a correctional officer uniform, like walking up to our house at night because he got up at 11 police just waving his light on him and stuff like that you my dad Did, do you think he ever also faced him. some something from the black community too as well being a black police officer a they sometimes officer. or a correctional officer mm -hmm. he was a correctional officer yeah. it's just different mm -hmm. but do you, do you feel like or no or yes or uh, it, it, it really kind of depends mm -hmm. um i think in our neighborhood like it was more like a respect thing mm -hmm. it was a respectful thing Mm. So they would be like, because my dad is also a pastor, so they'd be like, oh, don't mess with Rev. Like, don't, don't do that. Because there are lots of African Americans within the police force mm -hmm. and, and, and also in correctional facilities mm -hmm. as well. And uh, working there as officers. Or, mm -hmm. um, and so um, do you feel that um, that can create a more equitable society or do you feel like Sometimes structural racism is just it, still kind of built into the system. It is. So even a black mm -hmm. officer could also it is. kind of. Yeah, it is most definitely. Sorry to cut you off. No, that's um, okay. It is definitely built into my, the system. My dad mm. was a correctional officer, but he's also a security guy at Mercy Hospital downtown. Uh -huh. So he had two jobs, right? Mm. So 
in most ways, I think he enjoyed his job as correctional officer more mm -hmm. because at the hospital, he experienced a lot of racism. He was mm -hmm. a patient. Mm -hmm. um, they were trying to restrain him, punch him in the mouth and call him the oh N-word. Like, it's, and you know, the hospital wasn't really, <laughs> really wasn't, you know, mm -hmm. trying to do too much about it. So I think that as a correctional officer, in some way, my dad is considered a hero, a correctional officer and a pastor. Like, mm -hmm. my God, you're doing a lot. Mm -hmm. Now he's retired, though.